Hello, and welcome to the virtual program tonight on Jonas Hassan Kamiri's latest novel, The Family Clause, published by FSG. As we face unpresented, unpresented upheavals in our everyday life, as well as our cultural lives, it's a great thrill to welcome everyone here tonight throughout the US, and especially our partners who helped make this literary event possible. The program is presented by the American Scandinavian Foundation at Scandinavia House in New York, the Embassy of Sweden in collaboration with the American Swedish Institute in Minneapolis, the American Swedish Museum in Chicago, the American Swedish Historical Museum in Philadelphia, the Consulate General of Sweden in New York, and the Consulate General of Sweden in San Francisco. Uh, I know that everyone is working very diligently, continue to bring the best of Swedish and Nordic culture to the US, and I encourage everyone to visit their respective websites. Now I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce the ambassador of Sweden to the United States, Karin Olaf's daughter, who will introduce Mr. Kamiri. Thank you very much. And it's fantastic to hear about all those uh, great Swedish institutions, Swedish American institutions all across the country. Uh, so hello to everyone who is watching uh, from this uh, fantastic uh, country and uh, being interested in Swedish culture. Well, it is really my great honor to introduce one of Sweden's finest authors, uh, Jonas Hassan Kimiri. He is a very productive uh, man. He has published five novels, six plays, collection of essays and short stories. Uh, he's translated into 30 languages. Um, he has won uh, Sweden's finest literary prize, the August Prize for Fiction. Uh, he has also won, I can actually show you, there's a whole list here of all the prizes uh, he has won, so I'm not going to tell you, but you can realize how, by this, how, how successful uh, Jonas has been. Um, maybe his most well-known uh, um, piece of fiction yet is Montecori, The Silence of the Tiger. Um, this year he should have been in the United States physically. He won uh, or got a fellowship with the Kalman Center uh, at the New York Public Library. Uh, and he was one out of 15 uh, very successful scholars and writers who got uh, this fellowship. But uh, given uh, the times we are in, Jonas is still in Stockholm and has postponed and deferred his visit to New York uh, till next year when hopefully all of us uh, are out of this uh, pandemic situation. And also I would just like to say to anyone who's listening, uh, deep condolences if anyone in your family has passed away due to the, due to the virus. Tonight, uh, we are going to talk about Jonas latest book, uh, The Family Clause. It was just published in English here in the United States. So thank you so much for having me and thank you so much for engaging in Swedish American uh, relations uh, and our culture. Thank you. Um, I encourage everyone to purchase the books if they have not done so already through bookshop.org uh, or through your local bookstores. Um, and following the end of the conversation, uh, if you want to ask questions to uh, Jonas, uh, you can put your questions into the chat function uh, located on the bottom of your Zoom window. Uh, I'll be moderate, moderating throughout the, the, the conversation. Um, moderating tonight's conversation is Joshua First, who is the author of Revolutionaries, published by Knopf. Uh, uh, which is a novel and a little red stroller uh, published by Dial Books, a children's picture book, uh, both published in 2019. His first novel, The Sabotage Cafe, was named to the 2007 year end best of list of the Chicago Tribune, the Rocky Mountain News, the Philadelphia City Paper. Uh, he is also a frequent contributor to the Jewish Daily Forward and is, has been and published in the Chicago Tribune, Esquire, Salon, Nerve, Conjunctions, Pen America, Five Chapters, Bomb, and the New York Tyrant. He is a graduate, graduate of the Iowa Writers Workshop and Joshua is the recipient of the Mishner Fellowship, the Chicago Tri Tribune's Nelson Elgren Award, and the fellowships from the McDowell Colony and the Leidig House, and he teaches at Columbia University. So please welcome Joshua and Jonas. I just need to unmute them first. Uh, one second. Oh, there we go. Oh. Okay, now we're ready to go. Okay. Hey. 
Hi, uh, Jonas. It's nice Hi. to see you. Um, uh, I thought that uh, a good way to start would be for uh, us to hear uh, sort of how you would describe the family clause, sort of if you could explain sort of what the book is and how it work, how it works, what it what it does. This, uh, what it does, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'd be happy to do that. Um, I would just like to say that I'm really, uh, thank you for these introductions and I'm really happy to be here even though I'm not physically where the book is at the moment. Uh, I'm in Stockholm and as, as many people, we had um, plans for this year that has not really um, been realized and uh, we're safe and sound in Stockholm but the original plan was that we would actually be in the States right now to to kind of uh, accompany the novel um, but it feels great that I can actually do it this way um, virtually so thank you for the introduction thank you very much Joshua for doing this so um, as you know as a writer it's always tricky to get that you know like what is the novel actually about but I could try to kind of um, I can tell you that on the surface, it looks quite kind of um, easy to describe. We follow a family during 10 days, and there are three main characters in this, fa this family. There's the father, um, the son, and the sister. And these three characters, they're kind of trying to, um, trying to stay a part of this family and renegotiate the terms of this family at the same time. Um, it starts off with this, the father who is not old, he has diabetes, he has, um, um, he's depressed and he has kind of, he's, he's slowly going blind. He returns to Sweden in desperate need of help. Um, and he's depending on his now adult children, the sister and the son, I can call them because they don't have names in the book. Um, and he's dependent on them to kind of help him with all of the practical things that are part of becoming older. You know, like they need to help him with like getting things at the doctor or putting, taking care of his um, mail or like finding ho housing for him. Um, but the problem is that um, they have done this for so many years. So now is the time, especially the son has kind of, the son has kind of a, like a mathematical mind. So he has kind of calculated the amounts of years that the father took care of him and then kind of compared it with the years that he has taken care of the father. And he says, this is it. We are actually even now because, you know, like 17 years, like you took care of me a certain amount of years, then I took care of you. So he wants to shift something. The son says, this is over. We have to change the family. And then when he does that, when he kind of, you know, utters this kind of um, dangerous thing in a family, we need to change, then kind of things sp spiral, maybe not downwards, but there's a lot of friction that, that happens. And um, one other thing is that um, this family has kind of um, a ghost or a secret that nobody's really willing to talk about. And... Uh, through this decision by the son, kind of secrets are um, resurfaced, and they have to they have to find new ways of staying a family. One could say that was that's the book for some kind of summary version. Yeah. Um... It's, it's, you're right. It's, an, it's, it's it's a very hard book to summarize because that's there is there is story and plot there in that manner. Mm. But the experience of reading the book is very much about the sort of the viscerally lived experience of moment to moment reality, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and I'm I'm really curious about how you. I mean, I've got I'm curious about a variety of things in relation to that, but yeah. um, but I guess how you keep that texture mm. while moving the uh the action of the story around without us feeling like there's ever any action we're just with these people you know yeah and that just on a on, on the level of like literary approach that's a fascinating gamut mm. yeah thank you i 
I remember as I was writing it, I had this, actually before we started this talk, we, we briefly like mentioned Nabokov and Tolstoy and like one of the things in all the writers that I admire the most, one of the things they do is that they, they manage to create a feeling of proximity with the characters. Tolstoy does it in his way, Nabokov actually does it in a certain way. I remember hearing, I think George Saunders at one, one point talked about a form that he used in his short stories that he called uh, third person, and this is a tricky word in English for me, ventriloquists, right? Ventriloquism, yeah. Yeah, like third person ventriloquists. Ba basically what he does is like, he goes up really close in third person to uh, the perspective of the character that we're following. Mm -hmm. um, I, in the book, that is what happens. We are following yeah. these main characters, but we are lying so close, kind of, it's a third person narrative, but we are following them so closely so that we actually understand who they are through the way that they experience their family dynamic. Uh -huh. Um, I think that's, I've always been fascinated by kind of the way that we remember things, you know, the way yeah. that we kind of choose to remember certain aspects of ourselves. Um, it's particularly interesting. I think it's, it, it kind of, this is particular energy when you do that within a family. Uh -huh. and I, I think the simple reason is just like within a family, we almost have to create a narrative for ourselves. Uh -huh. you know, I, I do that with my kids, like we are a family who, this is not what we do in our family. Like we create uh -huh. Uh -huh. continuous kind of the way you do in a family, in a country, you know, you uh -huh. create a narrative of who we are. Um, the interesting thing is in all families, uh, there is also, there are always things that are kind of, you know, where when no one, re events that no one remembered the same way. Yeah. You know, you remember that Christmas 98, you know, like Aunt Shashtin got too drunk. No, actually it was Lennart who never showed up with the post, like whatever it is, but like within families, we all have these kind of, um, you know, when, when the, the narrative pieces of the puzzle don't fit. Um, yeah. And that's what happens in the book. So we follow the sister, the son, and the father, but we quickly realize that they are not remembering the same event, or actually they remember the same event, but in very different ways. Uh -huh. So, you know, to, like to use a, an example, like the, the son is just like so tired of buying his father coffee. Like yeah. his whole life, he's buying his father coffee. And, and, the, and uh, you know, when he's like, um, it's just like a small conflict, but for the, for the son, when he says like, why can't you buy your own coffee? Why can't you for once give me something? That conflict has nothing to do with the coffee. It's well, the son saying kind of, why didn't you take care of me the way I needed, kind of? Um, well, and, and but the way that the way that you choose to present that also, it's in yeah. the context of, like, we're watching him clean the kitchen, and, yeah. and every little step of the cleaning of the kitchen, mm -hmm. and all of the associations that are attached to that coffee can, yeah. or that doorknob, or yeah. you know, or whatever the other things he's cleaning up are, and so there's a, there's an accretion of memory. Mm. Through the through the tangible reality in which they're existing, which is sort of allows a kind of a I want to say a porous relationship between the present and the past. That yeah, you you found some way to exploit. I think here. Yeah, no, but actually, it, it kind of it started with me being on paternal leave and thinking a lot about what it means to be a good parent. Mm -hmm. Like, what is it? Like, what does it mean to be good? You know, yeah. and and um, one of the things that I realized was as you know kind of one thing that kept coming back for me was this idea of presence. Uh -huh. You know, like, well, I knew, I know that a good parent's like present all the time, like 100% focus on the kids, you know. Uh -huh. And the logical consequence of that is that um, if the, you have that idea of a parent as someone who's always present, then the totally normal feelings or thoughts that you have sometimes as a parent, you know, sometimes it's boring, Sometimes you just want to read in peace. Sometimes yeah. you just want to be alone. Um, those feelings or thoughts became kind of weirdly charged 
just because they were forbidden. You know? mm -hmm. um, so I, I think that's one of the keys into the book. That was one of the keys that I want, things that I wanted to investigate because the son in the book, he has this idea like, I will never be like my father. Yeah. I will never leave my kids. I will be so present that my kids will never be like, um, they will always sense my presence. And if for a character like that, who has this thing that he's not supposed to feel, you know, um, for a character like that, um, it's almost obligatory that at a certain point, if you repeat to yourself, I will never leave, I will never leave, I will never leave, at a certain point, I think he must get out, you know, in order to kind of, um, the question is whether or not uh, he returns or not to his kids. So that's a thing that happens in the book, actually, that the son is kind of so focused on not becoming something that weirdly enough, he becomes it. Um, well, it's, it's exacerbated by the fact that he's in the presence of that thing. Yeah. The father yeah. and, and yeah. Is, is up against other people's perceptions yeah. of the father that, you know, his children, he can't control how they perceive the grandfather despite maybe his, yeah. his, his, his most ardent attempts to control it. Yeah. Um, but it's also this, uh, this round robin of perspective mm. creates a, it's like the book is having a conversation with itself about how parenthood changes a person's perspective of themselves, of their parents, um, of their children. I thought that um, there was a, there was a kind of an evolution we could see. Uh, I mean, I'm not going to say in your thinking, mm -hmm. but in the in the novel creates the sense of an evolution in thinking. Yeah. Um, because of that conversation, that, and I I wondered if you how how central that was to your yeah. your sense of what you're trying to do. Yeah. I knew that at some point I wanted the grandfather to kind of um, realize that it was that he could not turn back time. Uh -huh. So we have these three characters, the father, the son, and the sister. And we also know that the father at some point has had another daughter in another relationship uh -huh. who he has abandoned. Um, so that's kind of the secret in this family, that there is another kid who nobody can really mention. She's a part of the family, but she's not. You know, she has this kind of vague identity. But this child, like, her life has not ended well, one could say. Like, so the father walks around with kind of this heavy body of, of full of guilt, thinking that, you know, maybe my, the fact that I didn't take care of her, or maybe the fact that I left her, created chaos in her life. Maybe I'm the one to blame for it. He doesn't have the words to say that, but he, I think he feels it in his body. It's really heavy to walk, in, walk around in a body full of guilt. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, and one of the things I knew when I started out the book, you know, as a, as a writer, you, you can't control it, but you have kind of certain you have kind of vague images where you know that you will end up. One of the things I knew that was that the grandfather at some point would kind of invent a time capsule of his own and realizing that he didn't take care of his kids would take care of the grandchildren. Uh -huh. And I was kind of wondering when that would pop up in the book. And actually it, it pops up right in, towards the end of the book uh -huh. when when the son has disappeared and the grandfather actually who has never been a good father steps in to yeah. some kind of rescue like he's there for one night he's there for a couple of hours actually uh -huh. but during those hours he does it you know uh -huh. he reads the he reads to them he takes care of them and he in some way i think he heals him heals himself yeah. through that action um then you know, there's a new day and, and life resurges and then things become tricky again. But during yeah. that night, I think there's, there's something in that turning time on its head that, that yeah. heals him. I think. Well, it's also, it's interesting, sort of in the context of your, your other writing, 
mm. these monstrously flawed father figures mm. and, 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 and the space of um, forgiveness almost that exists for this one in, in, in those moments, you know? Mm. Um, I'm, I'm just imagining it must have taken a lot to get there. <laughs> Thing is, I often like, especially especially with this yeah. book, it started off much more like now it's time for me to tell my version. Like yeah. it's not at all. Like it often starts more, much more in a. It started off with like more trying to write a version, like a portrait of a family that I recognize quite a lot from my family. Uh -huh. The kind of like focusing on the son's perspective, but uh -huh. as I started writing the father, it's it's really tricky to be in his world and not kind of, I don't know if understand is the right word, but mm -hmm. kind of, um, I don't know. I, I just got him more and more, the more I wrote yeah. about him. You know, yeah. I, I got his background. I got the fact that he came from like the, kind of, um, the struggle he has had. Mm -hmm. um, and I think in some ways I, I understood my own father a little bit involuntarily as well. <laughs> like, yeah. Because I have my narrative of our yeah. past and yeah. you know, how much I have done for him. And like, oh, we all walk around with all, all these kind of our own personal takes on, on family history. And I think involuntarily, I kind of, by writing the father, I think I understood mm -hmm. my father more, um, especially the pain of, realizing too late that you can't go back yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's something we can all relate to even though we haven't like i think one of the worst versions of those pains is of course if you've had a kid that you felt that you could say but ultimately didn't yeah but we all have those moments in our life where we kind of like you know um we would we would choose another path if we went back into time yeah. Um, do you think that there's a relationship between the the ability to to see those limitations, see that to see that hardship, to see see the burden that 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 the, that your father carries, that one's father carries? Um, does do you think there's a relationship between that and and having children of your, of your own, or or the character having children of his own, or however you want to interpret that? Is it possible before you start to see someone else look at you in that way? You know. I'm not sure. Um, no, I, I couldn't have written this book before I was a father myself, okay. that's for sure. Um, I mean, it feels that way. Some, yeah. Feels that way. yeah, there was something I remember. I had this idea before I became a father that they would just, like, my kids would just, like, come out in these mini uh -huh. you know, that they would just, like, and it was so, one of the kind of, it sounds banal and obvious, but I, I, it was so obvious that they came out and were themselves. Okay. And they kind of, that I couldn't mold them, you know, that they were their own thing and they had their own okay. agendas and they were one love soccer. And I have never been on a soccer field in my life <laughs> before I had this kid, you know. But there's this um, kind of a feeling that they are actually, um, yeah, but they are not at all like uh, controllable the way that I moldable or the way that I felt before I had kids. And I think there's something also when I when I wrote it, I had this really strong feeling that um, I just knew that the daughter who had been abandoned in the book that she would come in, and I thought that she would be really rageful. Yeah. You know, she would come in and be kind of so angry that she, she had been left, that her life ended the way it did. Um, and I knew that she would come in kind of mid-book. And when she came in, it was with an energy that I hadn't expected. Kind of, she came, she comes, even though she's dead, she comes in and she has a body and she flies and she's she's the person who has no one is talking about but now she's here in the book it's a the way that that the way that ar that arises yeah is um structurally dramatic yeah you, you, you it's really interesting how 
you've set us on this pattern, on this path where we're going yeah. the three points of view. Yeah. And then the breaking of that point of view in that moment and moving to her yeah. does, does stuff on, on, on a plot level, on a story level, on sort of a, a psychological level, on a, on a level of how we understand all of the characters we've been reading about up to that point, too. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, and I knew that she was going to come in, but I had no idea that she was going to do what she did because she was forgiven. Like, she's the only one who's actually taking care of the father. Like she's the only one, like she saves him up from like a subway train, like she's speaking to him. We're not really sure if that's, you know, a real version of her or, or maybe that's the father's, um, the only way that he can think of her, you know. Um, but I thought that was interesting. That in some ways, it, I think it helped me that a daughter who had been so, and, um, who had experienced being left like that could in the book actually in some weird way forgive him. Um, and I think in some ways that's what we do, you know, as, as kids, like there's this continuous process of forgiving. Um, and, um, and I think that's... Um, and I think I don't think she forgives his action, his actions. I think she for, understands how much she, he tried. Yeah, I think that's the thing, it's, and I think that's quite similar to what I understood when I was writing the book. Yeah, it's it's, it's forgiving his humanity more than his actions. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you, and then you you interestingly break form one more time to give us the son's daughter's point of view. Um, mm. Which is sort of, I mean, it's, I don't even know if it was a conscious, but it, there's a mirroring that happens there, right? Oh, yeah. 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 It's funny to jump into the head of a four-year-old, though, so it's kind of... Yeah. yeah, and it's also very funny. Yeah, it's also like uh, an energy to the focus on certain, certain things and, yeah. and, the, and then pushing it a little bit when I jumped into the head of a one-and-a-half-year-old. That's kind of <laughs> strangely kind of big vocabulary for being one and a half years old. Yeah. yeah. But there was something else, I guess, with jumping into the heads of kids to show that if we don't deal with things now, mm -hmm. things will just continue. Like this, if we don't change things, the next generation will deal with it just the same way. And I had a fun thing of like writing the one and a half year old. And he's also quite, quite kind of, you know, he, he's kind of like, striking deals with his parents and you know if we do this then i will not wake up next night like um it, it, it was a fun way of, of kind of showing that um there is an act actually um it might be really tricky to solve these conflicts but mm -hmm. we better do it now because otherwise it's just going to continue in the next generation mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Well, it also, it also enlivens, I mean, it, it enlivens might not be the right word. word. It, um, it presents in material form how these conflicts are changing within their stasis at all times, yeah. regardless, of, regardless of whether or not we're facing them, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 How, yeah, um, there's, yeah. Also this, there's also this... Um, linked to the sister because she also has kind of a peculiar relationship to this you know mm -hmm. that we know that the sister has a son you know that she's pregnant and we during these 10 days we follow her, her decision of whether or not to have another baby mm -hmm. and she has this really strong feeling that it's not it's too painful to have another one mm -hmm. it's not the pain of giving birth to one it's the pain of having a kid who has chosen not to live with her because that's her experience. She, she has a teenage boy who has chosen not to live in her, like basically has broken up with her. Yeah. Um, and, and that's the most pain that she has ever experienced. Like it doesn't come close to you know, being separated from her husband, ex-husband or anything. Like to have your own flesh and blood to say, actually, I don't want you in my life anymore. That's, that's the most painful thing that, that she has experienced. So that's also another take on these, you know, how this kind of one separation within the family can kind of 
continue to spiral down into new generations. It, it creates a very, very direct parallel too, because it's, I mean, as, as we go through time with her, yeah. she feels like she's got a secret. Yeah. But her secret is, is alive and the father's secret is not, right? Yes, yes. And, and, and yet they both, yeah. they both have a, they both have a similar pull on, on the character's consciousnesses, which is, yeah. Yeah, yeah that, that's actually, I haven't thought about that, but there's actually quite a, an interesting link there. Um, yeah. 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 Um, you, again, sort of looking at this in relation to your larger Uva, um, you're always so, there's always a formal concern, you know, mm -hmm. in your work. And I'm wondering, about the interplay between the narrowing down of the formal rules and formal constraints that you placed mm -hmm. on this, which are very, I mean, they're clear, but they're, they're not intrusive in any way. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and sort of the expansive room that you created for these characters, if there was a, how you arrived at that, or if, if, you, yeah. if you decided, here are my rules and I'm just gonna see where it goes, or what's the yeah. process of that? Yeah. Well, actually, this is kind of a new, um, in every book, uh, this is kind of the first first time I do like third person uh, present tense, um, and I have never really. Um, I think in the earlier books I've had the feeling that there have been they have been more voice driven, mm -hmm. like more of a narrative um, kind of a, a singular subjective who's like driving the narrative, and yeah. and oftentimes in, especially in the first two novels there was this feeling of like having one voice. Or like different voices colliding and then kind of lifting up that voice and seeing that there was something else behind you know that there was this thing narration and then picking it up and then ta-da you know the kind of ta-da moment you know and then i i just felt that that was a bit mechanical <laughs> you know what i mean that there was this thing of like narrative voice ta-da like and i felt yeah. that I didn't want to do that anymore. So in yeah. the, uh, the novel before this called Everything I Don't Remember, we meet, um, um, it's back to actually a writer who's trying to collect evidence of a person who's no longer alive, but all he has is kind of the, the, the voices of the recollections of him. So there's a young man called Samuel who's passed away in a, car accident and then the book consists of everything that people remember of him and a little bit similar to what happened in this book is um, that someone is gone but the the kind of the the uh, the disappearance has left a really big uh, shadow uh -huh. and people are walking around within that shadow and trying to make sense of what what really happened uh -huh. Um, so structurally in this book, I was interested in kind of just um, being even more, um, collapsing time even more. So I had the structure of like the 10 days and then I was interested to in see how much I could fit within those 10 yeah. days because like that's a nar narrative arc in itself. But since these are family members who are kind of um, almost like battling their own story or history, um, oftentimes they are in the presence of something and then a memory erupts or, or and we are transported back into time and we understand why this specific scene kind of hurts so much. Yeah. Well, there's also the, the lack of names and the, the, the sort of the ironic distance you create with the yeah. way that they get named at the beginning of every section, right? A son who is a father. Um, I'm just flipping through the page, the grandfather and the tourist. This, yeah. There's always, I mean, I think like like a daughter who is also a mother. There's there's a way in which we can we can we can sense a critical mind telling us something about them beyond their experiences at the same time as we're deeply embedded in their experiences. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they're yeah. kind of defined by who they are in the families, right? Yeah. So the mother who's a father, the, the mother who's a sister, but maybe she's not a sister because her son has left her, you know, like uh -huh. um, the father who's maybe not a father because he has left his daughter. So they're defined by their relationships within the family. But the strange thing is that those relationships are also changing. Yeah. So for example, the son can be very much a father to his kids, um, 
but the moment when his father arrives, the grandfather, he becomes a son again, you know? So uh -huh. and that's my experience of just like being in a family, you know, like loving them to death, but also feeling like, who are these crazy people? Like, I don't have anything in common with you. I love you to death, but there's like, I don't understand how we're gonna, you know, make this um, family gathering, um, how we're gonna survive it together. And then at the same time, like I couldn't see myself without them. You know, like all these kind of um, mixed emotions that you, yeah. for, for people who are like your, your, your flesh and blood. Right. Um, and um, that was also, they kept resisting, you know, when, when they are not named, as you mentioned. And I, I, I was quite curious about that myself. I wasn't sure why. Um, you know, there's a kind of a formal way of explaining it that, you know, yeah. names quickly became, it's maybe a, a name is always something static, right? A name tells you something about these people's ethnicity, their cultural background, their heritage. Yeah. So what if we don't give them that? Yeah. What if we don't limit them to being one thing? Well, maybe that's... You know, on purpose, they don't have names and there are no countries mentioned except Sweden. We know that the father comes from another country to Sweden. Um, those who know, know, you know, they're like, um, but I thought it would be kind of, since the book deals so much with freedom, I yeah. think maybe that this is the reason that it was my way of liberating these characters. Yeah. You don't need to be stuck in your names. You can actually... When the book ends, you will be free. Maybe that was. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the, well, you know. it also it also sort of interestingly in a in a kind of a counterintuitive way, because it seems like it would make them more distant for the reader. It, yeah. it creates a much more experience for a much more intimate experience for the reader, which is fascinating. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, but you know, like you know, as a writer, some things are. You know, there are fictional choices that you choose. And then there are a lot of them that you just like, it was very obvious that this was supposed to be like, they were not, they didn't want names. Um, yeah, they make their own decisions. Yeah, yeah. Um, can, uh, can, we, can we hear a little bit of the book? Can you read us a portion? Yeah. Um, I was actually thinking uh, I could read, um, I would like to read just a short section where we meet the sister and when she is being, um, so to set it up, we, we have like, it's a Sunday dinner. Um, the sister and the son are expecting the father. The father will not, spoiler alert, but not really. <laughs> the, the father is like heading to the dinner, but ultimately never arrives because he's, he has, he has other things to do, he has issues, or he's just fearful of, of uh, confronting them so the sister and the brother will have like a Sunday dinner together and then just before the brother arrives the sister has received a, a message from the long, estranged son and he has written something which is very very um, aggressive so in the beginning of this section she's just like trying to deal with the fact that that her son has composed these words that are just too painful to internalize um, for the fun of it, I, I thought I would just read a few lines in Swedish just to hear the original and then I would read in English. That makes sense. Right. En syster som är en mamma läser orden från sin son igen och igen. Hon sätter sig i soffan. Hon lägger sig på sängen med huvudet under överkastet. Hon påminner sig om att det som hennes pappa sa till henne när hon var liten, när hon var ledsen. När Elise Petrén eller Francesca Åberg hade sagt något taskigt om hennes födelsemärke i omklädningsrummet. Eller när Max Lutman hade retat henne för hennes håriga underarmar. Pappan satte sig på huk och viskade att de säger bara sådana saker för att de är avundsjuka. De har nämligen förstått att vi inte är som dem. Vi är dubbelt mycket mer. Du kanske tror att du är en vanlig person, men det stämmer inte, viskade pappa. Du har vingar, du är en drottning, du har stjärnfall i dina ådror, dina ögon är fullmånar. Så 
So here's that section um, in the lovely translation by Alice Menzies. A sister who is a mother reads the words from her son over and over again. She sits down on the sofa. She lies down on the bed and pulls the bedspread over her head. She reminds herself of what her father used to say when she was young, when she was sad, when Elise Petrian or Francesca Åberg said something horrible about her birthmark or in the changing room, or when Max Lutman teased her about her hairy forearms. The father would crouch down and whisper that they only said those things because they're jealous. They realize that we're not like them, you see. We're double them. You might think you're an ordinary person, but you're not, the father whispered. You got wings. You're a queen. You got shooting stars in your veins. Your eyes are full moons. Is that true? She said. And the father nodded. For once, he was serious. We're not like everyone else, he whispered. We're space angels. Everything we are has always existed. Do you know what a person is made of? Oxygen, hydrogen, carbon, and a few other elements like nitrogen and calcium. That's all it takes to make a person. Before you were born, I wasn't interested in having any more children. I had a daughter, I had a son, and, thought, and though I'd had them with two different mothers, I thought it was enough. The world felt full. Then you came along and everything changed. You weren't like anyone else. You were a masterpiece, the end point of humanity. I can spend hours looking at your elbows, the hollows of your knees, the concerned crease you got above your one eyebrow that I recognize from my own reflection. And that birthmark isn't ugly. It's beautiful. It's a sign that you're the chosen one. Chosen for what? She asked. No one knows, said the father. Not yet. But we're both greater than our context. We're smarter the 99.9% .9 of the world's population. We're more beautiful, funnier, we're more musical, we think quicker, run faster, sell better, and therefore get higher commissions. So high that people feel threatened by us. Bosses get scared that we'll take their jobs. That's why they lie and say we have problems with authority and that we're selling things for our own gain. That's why they recommend that we're giving the boot, but it's not true. It's the bosses who have the problem because they can handle people who take initiative and don't show any visible weaknesses. The father caught his breath. We're just too smart, said the father. Too smart to work with normal people. Too smart to subject ourselves to their idiotic rules. What rules, she asked. All rules, he said. We're made from a meteorite that became a tadpole, that became a triceratops, that became a hat stand, that became an orange tree, that became your grandmother, that became me, that became you. And we're never going to die. So that was her kind of rem remembering, remembering the father when he was not gone, you know, when he was present, when he made her feel loved. When, and that's also the mystery, you know, that someone who can leave and has negative um, aspects of the personality can also be a good person. That's a, that's that's the tricky thing, you know. That's the part that haunts us, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and the father, as you saw, has this ability also to kind of go into a certain drive of um, being quite. Yeah, there's a certain power also in in the act of making things romantic or making things. I think they have, he has the abil the ability to tell a story when he wants. Yeah. I think that's what he does. Yeah. Yeah, he can be very charming when yeah. it suits him. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. We're, we're starting to get some questions from uh, the audience. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll read them as they come in. So um, one is, is this, and I think by this, this uh, audience member means the, like the book itself, the, the yeah. story that's being told in the book. Is this a description of life uh, that's common to the Scandinavian culture? Well, that, I think that's a really interesting question because um, I'm not really sure how, I don't know how it works with paternal leave, you know, in, in, 
uh, in other countries. Um, it's quite peculiar, I know, in, in Swedish context that we have this kind of um, more normalized than in some other countries that, uh, that it's, um, that it's, it's seen as a good thing if parents share um, uh, the, you know, the, the, the section, like being home with, with kids yeah. after, after the mother has given, given birth. Um, I don't know how, how Swedish it is, to be honest. Um, when it was published in other countries, um, I was thinking at some point, well, maybe this would feel really foreign, the fact that, that there's this normalized way of staying at home. At the same time, I think this is just, um, it's just contemporary families, you know, like we're, especially in these times when like so many people are just like forced to be at home with the kids and like the whole schooling and all of that. Um, I think the, these, the kind of the core thing of the book, I think is just like um, this, more than the specific Scandinavianness, I think there is this question of like, how do we, how do we change and remain a family? I think that's a really tricky thing. I have no answers to that at all, but there's this, I find it deeply fascinating. Like how, if we're part of something and we love each other and we, we want to stay together and still we want to change, how can we do that? Yeah. Um, and, um, and just from my own life, I think it's the moment like I, small thing like my my brother recently moved you know he was in one place and then he moved to another place and that it's it's nothing but it changed things like before he was close to me now he's close to my mom like it's but in that in these small changes every time something changes in the family everyone else has to adapt and if there's like in this specific family like big changes then um it can create a lot of yeah. fights yeah and and the small details in the book are recognizably swedish but the the experiences are are, are sort of as you're describing them i think yeah. Uh, yeah yeah so we have another question can you tell us how you worked with your translator alice menzies yeah um she's just an amazing translator and, and normally what i do when i work with translators is that, that i i have um uh, for every translation i gather the questions i get and then I collect them in a growing Word document. And then for every new translation, I send, my agent sends out that document. So for every new translation, the translator get like the previous translator's questions, because they're always questions. Yeah. Um, with Alice, we just stay in touch via email about um, spe specific questions she had. And then uh, I read through um i started like it's a weird thing of reading yourself in translation because i think that in a way it's like um me reading it in swedish is so close but when i read it in english i can kind of it's me but it's not me you know that's mm -hmm. kind of you yeah. see yourself but it's not it's actually her recreating the words so it's it was uh, just um Lovely experience working with her. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, great. All right, here's here's another one. This is a multi-part question, so we're uh, it's got a few steps to it. You mentioned in interviews that you have gone deep into many authors, Kafka, Faulkner, etc. Mm -hmm. Are you a completist, reading all books by an author when it comes to reading? If so, do you read the books in order? How do you decide to move on to another author? And do you still read this way? Wow. Um, no, I've never been like, um, when I was younger, I was more a completist. What, what do you say, what would you call it? Completist. Completist. Completist, Completist you know? yes. I would say that I, I was, um, yeah, I had like a Faulkner phase and a Kafka phase. And I, yeah, when I was kind of um, going deep into like uh, reading diaries and stuff, like, uh, um, yeah, like the diaries of these authors, you know, going that that 
um, but um, it's been a while. Like lately, I've had um, I've been more in kind of discovering one writer, not at all all caring about chrono chronology, uh -huh. uh, but just being whenever I find a new universe to kind of rest in. It's such an amazing feat. And it's, uh -huh. I just have the feeling as a reader that it takes longer and longer for me to find those writers or those worlds. Um, but I had it recently when I just like quite late discovered Svetlana Alexievich, who is quite sadly in the news now. Just like discovering that body of work and then just like reading through it quite ruthlessly, not at all caring about chronolo chronology, but just like, um, and also getting to it, my secret has always been to getting to it when the when there's no hype, just because that's my, I had a hard time reading Bolaño for a long time because there was such a hype about it. And then when I finally read it, I, I loved it, especially the short stories. But sometimes I think that that's the key to kind of making books real again for me. It's just that I have to have this illusion that this is something you know, as you did when you were a kid, you were kind of picking up books in the library and you were just like, you had this illusion that no one else knew about this. Yeah. You know, like this is, I'm the only one who knows about this Faulkner dude. Um, and I think that's like, I still have that to this day. I, I really okay. like that thing. And you're also, when there's, when there's too much hype, you're reading the publicity instead of reading the... Publicity. Exactly, the reviews and you know, then people reading it because you're supposed to be reading it or whatever. So I like to wait a little bit and then, and then see what pops out. Yeah. Okay, some more questions. Uh, what are you, what's, you, what's your next work? Are you gonna go back to writing theater, a new novel, short stories? What, what, what is in the works? I don't know. I don't know. I'm just like writing away. What I'm writing now looks very, very quite different from The Family Clause. Um, but The Family Clause looked quite different from everything I don't remember. So um, I just try to follow my, follow the energy of things. And um, I'm having a good time now, but I don't want to jinx anything. But it looks more like some, it looks more, what I, what I did after the family course was that I wrote a play. So that play has been, I do, I have kind of like, um, I go back and forth. So I wrote a play, uh, so now this looks more like something that should be one day published. How do you know which, how do you know, when you, when you just got an idea for a story, how do you know which, which form that idea is asking to, to be in? To turn into? With the family clause, it felt obvious that it had to be a book because it was, I think it's the most personal book that I've written. So it felt like, and I think books are the most personal form for me because just because I'm, I don't know, like a, I'm more of a book nerd than a theater nerd, you know, and I, I um, it just felt like this, it was such an intimate story and it felt kind of scary to release it out into the world. So I really felt like it should be a book. Um, and also it's really tricky to make like dead characters believable in plays, right? You need to have, like, dead characters are good in books, but it's tricky to make them. In movies, is awful. So, like, yeah. Um, but also, like, because it's also, come, uh, I had a lot of fear of releasing this book out into the world, also because I was writing things that I was um, recognizing from my own family. Yeah. And also, you know, recognizing myself and this son. You yeah. know, who's just like, walking around in the world being terrified of making a mistake you know having this idea that he's being watched by everyone all the time and just like trying to clench on to life so much that he can't live it um and i'm not saying that that's me but i recognize some aspects of him in me um sometimes i think he he's me if i hadn't had the courage to write it, it, it feels it feels like a very earned kind of kind of delicate exposure of yeah yeah something yeah yeah, yeah I, I I get him like I get I get him yeah. yeah 
Okay, this question, um, this question is, it's, it's a, I think, I think what the question is asking is, is, is relatively subtle. So let's make sure that mm -hmm. we, we understand exactly what it is. As you're a parent and the yeah. novel deals with childhood trauma, sort of, yeah. how does it feel to know that you will probably traumatize your own children in some way? Uh, intention versus impact. You don't mean to, but you do. The, yeah. the weight, I think is asking about the weight of, of that. Yeah. Well, hopefully this is like, I mean, I think like a trauma-free childhood is terrible. I think uh -huh. that would be like the most, like a perfect, I, I can't imagine something worse actually to have like a trauma-free, I'm, I'm aiming at like low intense, normal traumas, you know, they will have their, they will have, to sit me down and say, this is what the problem with your parenthood and I will never make the same mistake. Yeah, but it's almost like I can hear them, what they will say. Like they will say, yeah, you thought you were present, you were around, but that was only your body. Uh -huh. Your mind was nowhere to be found. <laughs> your mind was not thinking about the books or like reading Svetlana Iksievich on this, or just like this. So I think that's the thing that they were kind of, yeah. you know, they're going to be like, what kind of presence was that actually, you know? And then they will write their own book and then, you know, it will just continue, I guess. But, but um, I don't, you know, knock on wood, I don't think that they will say that I was not, that I was uh, physically gone for them because that has been such, such a big thing for me to kind of yeah right to, you know, to be physically present yeah yeah okay i think we have time for one more question and it it, it relates directly to the last question it's i think, mm -hmm. I think it's, a, it's actually a very good place to end yeah. um do you believe a family can always heal or are there instances where it's impossible um well i have to say that it's that it's possible to heal. Um, I have, I have to. I don't know if I believe it, but I have to say it. Um, from my own experience in my family, there has been a lot of things that have just felt. There have been a lot of moments, um, both. Yeah, there have been about a lot of moments in my past where I've just felt like that's never going to reconcile. That's never, those people are never going to talk again. <laughs> like that's, they will never be able to be in the same room. And then a few marriages, a few funerals later, you know, people come together. And I think, I, I think it's, it's always tricky to heal, heal traumas and to, to go back into time when, when especially if you f felt like someone has come done you wrong. Um, but I must say that it's, it's, we can work things out. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Um, this has been really fantastic. It's been really great to be able to talk to you about the book and about uh, you're thinking about the state of literature at the moment and, and all the rest of it. It's been a really good conversation, I feel. So thank, thank you, Jim. Thank you so much. Thanks. Take care. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for attending. Again, thank you for all our partners. Thank you, Joshua. Thank you, Jonas. Please go out and purchase the books from bookshop.org or your local bookstore. And please do join us again. Uh, thank you again for joining us tonight. <laughs>